I'm Nicholas Kuhner, founder of Wunderbrand, and we're going to deep dive into the world of branding, digital marketing, and entrepreneurship. My career includes working with some of the world's top brand and advertising agencies, as well as working at brands like Nando's, MTV, and Comedy Central, where for 20 years I've honed my expertise in building brands in emerging markets. Based here in Oslo, I lecture on digital marketing, helping the next generation of marketers navigate this dynamic world. I'm here to share powerful insights from my own journey and bring you the wisdom of leading voices in branding and marketing from across the globe. Whether you're an entrepreneur looking to scale, a student eager to learn, or a business seeking to elevate your brand, you're in the right place. Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today we have a, another fantastic guest, Bo Bennett. Dr. Bennett has a PhD in social psychology, runs over a dozen websites, has written over a dozen books on the topics, on topics as varied as critical thinking, and teaches several online courses. He's been in the self-publishing industry for over a decade and has written multiple screenplays. He's also an entrepreneur, actor, screenwriter, and AI ethics thought leader. So I think I'm going to leave the list there. Otherwise, the whole introduction, you know, will be 20 minutes in terms of all the amazing things you've done, Bo. But welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. I appreciate it. <laughs> you've got quite a few websites, and a lot of them end in AI. And you've done a lot of self-publishing and have had, had quite a few books out there. Maybe talk to us about some of your processes in terms of self-publishing a book and which book we should really look out for? I've been writing books since 2001. Right after I sold my first company of significant value, I started writing my first book called The Year to Success. And it turned out to be a 740 page like monster book that basically is a collection of about 250 different ideas that can help you get a little bit closer to achieving your definition of success, whatever that might be. So the concept of success is really not just one or two things that you do, but it's a combination of many different things that when implemented brings you a little bit closer to success. So that was the concept behind the book. It was an interesting process because back in 2001, the self-publishing industry was very differently. It was just unrecognizable from what it is today. I actually tried to get a traditional publisher and time after time I'd be rejected because people don't know me. Like I, I'm not a famous person or anything where people will just, publishers will just accept the book based on my name alone and reputation. So um, they, they looked at the book and they said, yeah, you know what? A year to success. Our readers don't want to wait a year. Why don't you redo the book and call it something like seven keys to success? Or maybe seven days to success. That's even better. And I was thinking, well, that's just not how this works. So very quickly, I had an introduction to the publishing industry, what it's about. It's about like guaranteed to make money. They wanted to make money as quickly as possible. They have a formula. If your book doesn't fit in the formula, they're not interested. So I went the self-publishing route, which basically meant spending about $30,000 of my own money to do a large print run of my book, storing them in my garage, get a distributor, set up all these relationships. It was a nightmare. And that process taught me that there's got to be an easier way. And it wasn't right away, but a few years later, maybe even like eight years later, I eventually started my publishing company like in 2010 called eBook It. And it was just the idea to, to help people get their books out there by eBook form. It quickly morphed to publishing with print books and then audiobooks. And now we do marketing. We do the whole gamut with self-publishing and including AI, like using AI to help to enhance your book and create your book. So it, it changed dramatically. And throughout that time, I've written over a dozen books myself, the old fashioned way without AI, uh, where they would take like months to write. And then I also have written like literally hundreds of books using the assistance of AI because you know, that changed everything. And that's where we are today. It, it's an amazing industry. I have a lot of fun with it. So if we just go back to your traditionally written books, and I suppose they're going to have a new, uh, you need to come up with a title for sort of traditional book media. 
yeah, versus right. AI, AI written media. I mean, to write 12 books is, is quite a, a feat um, in terms of research, in terms mm. of editing, in terms of, is this a useful book? Um, right. Because I'm, I'm sure you're not just writing it for a, an audience of an audience of one. When selecting titles and when selecting a, a target market, th these books, and if, if I have a look at some of them here, you've got Year to Success, Logical Fallacies, The Concept, Eat Meat or Don't, Reason, Book Ones and Two. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch here. If people had to think about Bo, what, what are you best known for? What are you trying to be best known for in terms of ideas that you're putting out in the market? Because obviously there's something pushing you Otherwise, you wouldn't be writing as voraciously as, as you are. Sure. Well, I think I'm really a philosopher at heart. I've always loved thinking about these grand ideas. And when questions come to me, they usually bug me until I really explore them thoroughly. And I realize there's really no better way to explore something thoroughly than writing a book about it. So over the years, like when I'd come up with this idea, take, take for example, the eat meat or don't, it, it's a book basically like, should we eat meat or should we not eat meat? Or is there something in the middle? Like, I don't want to like to give like a binary choice, but it was a catchy title. So when I get ideas like that, I, I think about them, I research them and I take like extensive notes on them. And then sometimes the answer is, or let's say the, the, the question is sufficiently answered in the process of gathering the notes and doing some research and thinking. And then I'm good. I'm like, okay, I'm comfortable with this idea. But sometimes when I actually go through this process, it turns out that I have enough notes for a fantastic book. And that's when I decide to put everything together in a book. And that's what we essentially have. So it's like, if there were one overarching topic, it's critical thinking. Um, science, reason, logic, critical thinking, it's all kind of encased together in, in that same overall topic. But that's, that's kind of where I'm, I've been going with different things. And yeah, sometimes I, I have enough information for a book and I decide to, to just share it with everybody because I believe that I came to, I, I explored the question adequately and thoroughly, and I came to a really good solution or I found a really good answer that people would appreciate. Even if they don't agree with me, they'd at least appreciate the perspective and it would give them an opportunity to think about this topic in some ways they haven't thought about it before. Well, critical thinking is a sorely needed subject that people should get themselves acquainted with, especially, especially in our current media environment. And I take it you from the States as well. So there's a, a lack of, <laughs> quite a lack of critical thinking, I think, in schools and universities, which takes me to my so the second point in terms of self-publishing, I know that Amazon and eBay and these folks will sometimes not stock certain books because of certain personalities, because of certain ideas that people have. And we are almost sort of only allowed to see certain things in the traditional publishing, publishing world. Have you found that as an, an issue for yourself when you have been getting folks publishing with you that they've come to you because Amazon just is not the right platform or is it more just because they are, they need a professional behind them to help them get the vision of their book out into the market? Do you still yeah. use Amazon and things like that to, to promote your eBooks and books? Yeah, actually in my experience, I have, I think only once or twice in the 15 years I've been doing this roughly, have I encountered a book that didn't get accepted or that I wouldn't accept due to the topic. I mean, we, we publish it. We like, as a publisher, we don't discriminate between subject matter. I think it, it's just kind of like the classic, like what's really truly hate speech or something that's absolutely horrible or terrible. Like I, I don't want to deal with it, but I've been fortunate enough not to get a lot of those submissions. We've, we get like, what I believe are like crazy, crazy, like batshit crazy ideas <laughs> from both the extreme left political wing and the extreme right political wing, um, conspiracy theories, end of the world scenarios, political 
conspiracies, like everything on the spectrum. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't judge. They want to publish it. I just publish it. I don't support the information in any way uh, because if they don't go for the me, they're going to go through someone else. So who cares? And Amazon or Google, like none of the major players has, has ever rejected anything due to content. Uh, there was like the one time I mentioned, there was something that was like, like a, like a, a complete Nazi type of literature, like somebody who was clearly like a Nazi. And I'm just like, nah, <laughs> this, this is, it crosses the line for me. You know, I don't want to touch this. And he understood too. I, and he was yeah. like, yeah, okay, fine. But yeah, for the most part, no, the, the, the publishing platforms that we deal with all the major players, Amazon, Google, Barnes and Noble, Scrib D, Kobo, they're, they'll take anything. It's uh, they they have like the same policy pretty much as long as it doesn't it's like not so extreme like you're teaching people how to build bombs or hey I'm going to kill the president or something like yeah. you know crazy that's illegal like that it's fine. So if somebody had to come and have a as you put it a batshit crazy idea of a of a book and they wanted to publish it with you, what are the kind of processes they they need to go through and what type of we don't have to go into detail on budgets but what kind of time period and what kind of work do they need to put in to to promote their book if they if they work with you well typically writing a book it takes however long some people could write a book in days it could a book could technically be three pages or two pages or something so it's not unheard of that you have a few a couple page book we definitely have some of those some authors who did that we also have some authors who've written over a thousand page book. So, I mean, these things span like the writing process could be, literally yeah. be days to years in terms of once we get the book, it's only a matter of days, literally before we get it out there, at least in ebook form, because that's really quick kind of formatting it, converting it, and then getting it out to the distributors before it's available, like on Amazon or Google or anywhere to purchase. Print book takes, we usually say about two weeks because we have the cover design to deal with and that's like fitting into the template. That's a little bit longer. Audio book, if we have the narration, we have a human narrator do it. That takes like a month or so, two months. So that's a little process. But really in, in the terms of publishing, it, it's not unheard of to get it out incredibly fast when traditional publishing, you're like, oh yeah, my book's going to be published in 2028. I can't wait. It's like, <laughs> what? What's going on? Like I turned it in. And you hear these stories, like, how could it possibly take that long? You finished your book and it's going to take the publishers two years, you know, whatever. I'm sure that they have like this old school process, but it's difficult to, I, I think, to compete in an industry where like the, the turnaround is so quick now with the traditional publishing where, where it takes like 12 months minimum to, to publish a book once you turn it in. And in terms of budget, you know, it's just a, like under a hundred dollars for an ebook, a couple hundred bucks, few hundred bucks for a print book, maybe a thousand or so for an audio book. It's not expensive. When I, when I talk preparation, I'm also touching on the marketing aspect. So there's the mm -hmm. publisher's role, which is just to get it out to these various platforms, but writers need to understand that there's a, the book doesn't just sell itself, right? So oh, there's yeah. a whole process that, that needs yeah. to go into it because, and that's, a big problem with some of the traditional publishers is that they might focus on one or two of the big names, but the rest of them, they just have to suffer there at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. What yeah, should, true. what should writers be aware of if they want to have a, doesn't even have to be a bestseller book, but to get their book on somewhere close to the number one on an Amazon niche, for example. Sure. Well, I try to remind our authors to keep in mind that when a book is traditionally published, Typically, the publishing house will spend ten to fifty thousand dollars on some like decent sized books to get it out there, get it marketed, to to do a a tour and all that. So think about that budget, and then people yell at me, like literally yell at me, because one of our services cost over five hundred dollars. And there's like, are you crazy? How is an author supposed to spend this much? <laughs> Like, I'll, I'll just take it, but I, I kind of remind them, like, what's needed to really publish and market a book, to market it effectively and get it out there. But I do remind them, we have, if, if all you have is $50, we have $50 services. However, if you have, like, several thousand dollars, we have packages that could really do a good job to get your book out there and marketed. 
and it, it's always tricky too, because like there, there, there are two major factors going on here, two major elements of a book's success. It's not just the marketing, but it's the book itself. Like if, if the book is not either good or if it's not marketable, all of the exposure in the world isn't going to help. Like you can, it, it's just it, too competitive in, of an industry to be able to kind of like fake it till you make it, you know, to do like a fancy sales pitch, a, a clever marketing gimmick and make the book take off. That doesn't happen. You, you'll get some sales with a fancy gimmick or a marketing pitch, but then it'll quickly die after you stop putting all the money into marketing. The key is to have a book that grows organically. And the way to do that is to have like a well-written book that people like to talk about and people like to share. And that's a challenge that, that is presented to, to many authors, myself included, because you mentioned before, it was, it was kind of funny. You said, well, clearly you don't write a book for an audience of one. I'm like, well, kind of, I do sometimes. <laughs> uh, it, let's uh, qualify that statement. If you were to say, in order to be like a successful author or to make money as an author, clearly to write it, yes, I agree 100%. Sometimes, myself included, I do write just for an audience of one myself. I don't care about the marketability of the book. I'm just like proud that I created this and it, it's a really good thought. And I just put it out there regardless of how well it'll do in the market. For example, one of my books that I wrote was my personal autobiography. I had a blast writing that. And, and I, I love reading it. I love listening to it, kind of taking me back throughout my life. And my, my friends love it who know me and my family really enjoyed it. So, okay, maybe an audience of 20 and, and it does not sell a lot and I'm okay with that. Yes. If you want to do, to like write a book that sells extremely well and you want to be a successful author, you do have to consider the market. Not only is your book good, are you a good author? Sure. Everybody thinks you're a good author. Everybody thinks they're a good writer. Otherwise they probably wouldn't do this. Uh, but it takes more than that. It takes a marketable book, something that not only resonates with the, the general readership, but something that could be marketed. Like, are there too many books in that niche already that are too competitive? Uh, is it just something that people don't really care about? There's a, so many factors that go into it, and there's a lot of research that, that would have to go into it. Um, but even then... I find that there's no really good, simple formula for research. A lot of it happens to be instinct as well. I hate to, to use that term, but when I, when I refer to instinct, I'm really referring to experience mostly, like experience with the market, knowing kind of, I got a feeling that this sells a lot better than other things uh, based on experience, not some magical, mystical power. But yeah, that's, it's, that's what it's about. It's about marketability. And what we do we, is marketing we ensure that your book is read. We get it out there. We get your book in the hands of readers. And from there, it's up to your book. So I did set myself up at that because obviously most of the good books are written for an audience of one. So I, you, you got me. There's this, I was going through again some of your books and a bit of your background. And we've got entrepreneur, scriptwriter. Uh, actor, but I think what's missing, the one thing that's missing there is uh, stripper, comic, a stripper. Uh, comic stripper, you know, <laughs> a stripper. Never did that. <laughs> is, is being a cartoonist. So I think that's because right. I see some parallels between some of your work and one of my, my favorite authors, mm -hmm. Scott Adams. So I think you're just missing the, you're just missing the, the, the comic strip writing. And then I think that will, that will be what sets you on. Uh, another, tra another tra it's, tra it's funny you mentioned that because when I, when I was producing my, my sitcom, I was going for an animated sitcom because, because of the scenes that I wanted to create, it, it would just be more, and it, it's a lot more cost effective to actually do that. And it turns out I went through a lot of different animators that all quit on me and they were like horrible. And so I had to do it myself. So I, I, I'm not like an artistic <laughs> person. I, I'm a graphic designer, I'm a graphic artist, but I can't like draw people and figures and shapes. However, I can use software like animation software. I, I was very good at that. So I ended up doing the animation myself for, for this sitcom and it, like, it, it's an adequate job. Is it, is it going to like be a hit on Netflix? Probably not, but on YouTube, you know, that's, it's good enough. 
and with AI today, with AI, you can, um, they're getting to the ability to do character consistency, meaning that you could tell AI to generate a character and then you could use that character in multiple scenes. And like, once that, that is kind of mastered, no software I've seen yet, you know, on when here we are on the 14th of August, a week after we talk, there probably will be something out because that's how quickly probably. it changes. <laughs> but, but nothing really is really good for character consistency. There are a lot of like tricks to it and ways to get, it. but once that becomes mainstream, wow, that is going to change everything. And unfortunately, a lot of good designers and artists are going to lose a lot of work. I, I totally agree. I think the the pace that AI is moving, and I use quite a few AI platforms for music, for design, for um, a variety of AI related activities, and the speed is just is just crazy. And it's yes, it might put some of these folks out of jobs, but I mean, drawing panel by panel that is donkey work. You can get a, a computer to do that or some AI to do that. So I don't think we're missing out too terribly much on that. Let's talk about your some of your websites. You've got, as I mentioned, a couple of websites ending in AI. And I think this can maybe take us into a, the second topic, which is ethics when it comes to AI in in the writing space. And I think you've done some talking and some writing on that. I've used AI to write an article for me. I said I wanted in the style of John Simpson, who's a fantastic BBC, fantastic author. Uh, and and journalist and out came the article sounding much better than I would write but in a very strange tone of voice which was similar to to John Simpson maybe talk to us through some of the ethics regarding writing a book using AI and uh, some challenges that you're currently facing in that space so some of the ethics we'll we'll begin there some people obviously are extremely upset about that especially authors when I first started advertising my company, bookbud.ai, that's that's a software I created using AI that allows people to essentially put in some inputs and the book is written for them, both fiction and nonfiction. Nonfiction, it's really, you know, here's the idea, go ahead and write it. The fiction book is kind of a, a iterative process where AI will write, you give it an idea to start at the right chapter, it'll write the chapter, you tell it what happens next, it'll write the next next chapter, then you tell it what happens next. So you're guiding. It's really fun. And and to be able to create a story like that with the help of AI, like so quickly. But when I advertised this on Facebook at first, the comments were like really nasty and people were like, eh, you know, this is just like unethical or you're putting authors out of work. And the, the typical like pushback that you find AI is going to destroy the world. And like just a lot of like hate against AI and, the, and me and the company. So I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe I'll just keep Google ads going where people are actually looking for it and let them stumble on it that way. So th there's a lot of hesitancy towards it. And I think that's just completely normal when a new technology, when we're faced with a new technology that has the potential to displace a lot of people's livelihoods. One of the common themes that we see is something like, I want AI to help me do my laundry so I have more free time to write, not to write for me so I have more free time for the laundry, which is, you know, it's kind of catchy, but, you know, the kind of writing, if, if it's the kind of writing that AI could do better than you, I argue, well, you should find something else, find like a more creative outlet. But there, there's always going to be something like that. Like I mentioned before, writing is not just about making a book profitable and selling it. it. It's also about the the process of writing. It's an enjoyable process. People like it. And if they could just make enough money to kind of justify that time, then then great. It's good enough. So so the ethics, you know, yeah, where, where do we go with the ethics? What what is ethical? I have a, I have difficulty when people use AI to write the book and just like give it an idea and then use their own name. I don't say that you can't do that, but I personally have an issue with that. I prefer that they use like a pseudonym, like just have like AI come up with a name and, and you know, that's fine. I have a big problem with people writing a book using AI, having AI write a book, and then using a pseudonym with, a, um, with an educational designation after the name, like PhD or MD or whatever like that. I think that's wrong. 
because, well, first of all, AI doesn't have the intellectual capability of a PhD level or an MD level. So the kind of information you get from that isn't, it doesn't match that designation. And plus there's, there's no real person that's taking responsibility for that content. So I think that's crossing the line. Taking and, and like putting your own name to it, that's kind of like taking credit for it. But there's, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line because really with this creative process, when you use AI to help create a book, sometimes it's just like, okay, write all this like middle stuff for me. Here are the main ideas that I have. These are my ideas. These are my concepts. Go ahead and like tie them together. Make it sound nice. Clean up all the language. And so like, is that your book? Yeah, I think it is. I think like those are really your ideas. It's no different than having a, like an editor. I mean, geez, yeah. when you. Well, that's what an editor's job is. Yeah, exactly. When, when you hand it a, a, like a manuscript to an editor, some authors say like, this is completely different. Like this isn't me, this isn't my writing, but they go with it because the publishing house makes them and, and their name's still on it. So, you know, it, it's, it's. A new world where we're coming across a lot of questions that will have to be like answered ethically. But those are the, those are like the two areas right now that I see where ethics play the biggest part. One aspect of book writing or, or being an author that some, that people forget is the brand behind the author. If one takes a look mm -hmm. at Hemingway, yes, he wrote beautifully, but there was also the brand of Hemingway. He was in World War II. He was in Cuba. He, he was a mad, a mad person. If we look at Picasso as well, yes, he was a fabulous artist and could do fantastic portraits and realistic styles, but his personality in terms of the society he was involved in, the causes he supported, his bad boy attitude, etc., those were very important in helping him sell his product, the same with Andy Warhol and a variety of other artists, there needs to be something, as you said, the book, it's just, you know, words next to each other. You didn't say that. I'm putting words in your mouth. Uh, when, it, <laughs> when it comes to books, it, the soul of the book comes from the, the, the author, basically. And you look into the history. Why did he write this? Ah, that's what he meant by this. This is the period. This is the, the era. These are the things that this person suffered with. And that's why writing auto, you know, autobiographies or biographies gives a, a much deeper insight into the, the thought process of the writer. And that'll, that's what will be lost when you're using AI because it doesn't have any pathos, doesn't have any feeling. It can just fake human feelings. So I think there's still a lot of space for, for authors with interesting backstories and backgrounds. If you look at Hillbilly Elegy, there was a, you know, with old J.D. Vance, there's a story behind that, and his background made it interesting. If so, just a random person spoke about yeah. that story, wouldn't be as wouldn't be as interesting. And the last thing I want to touch on here is you're talking about folks saying, "Ah, oh, this is going to take writers' jobs." We've gotten to this point where everyone gets a gold star, and I honestly believe not everybody deserves to float to the top. And we need to celebrate greatness. And if you're going to write, you know, a book using AI by pressing the button just by itself without any of your own inputs, it's never going to be a, a bestseller. So you're going to need to put in those additional steps that you mentioned and put in the work behind it in terms of marketing and telling your story and giving people something, a compelling reason to, to read your books. That's what I'd say about that. Yeah, there are m many books that people write that are obviously of varying quality, let, let's call it. I've been like evaluating books, uh, literally thousands of books over the past decade or so. And I could tell you with confidence that AI does a better job than about 95% of the average authors, which is, which is mind blowing. If you think about it. like right out of the gate, if you have like a parent AI written book, that's done well, let me say, Lee. You can't just tell AI, obviously, to write a book. There has to yeah. be the correct like algorithm behind it that, uh, that prevents duplication, the content that has consistency and, and all of that stuff. But for the most part, like a well-written AI book is better than 95% of the majority of the authors. 
But that still means that 5% of the authors can do a better job than AI. And that's the important part because there's still that, that big opening for, for the authors, like you said, somebody with, with um, their own histories and their pasts and their feelings, their human emotions it goes into the writing. And that's kind of what people celebrate. That's kind of what, what, what brings people to tears that makes people feel like, like incredibly emotional. I I haven't read a book by AI that has that had that kind of effect on me but I I say that because most likely there's just not a good sample size I haven't read. most of the books that I've read through AI that I have written are nonfiction so they're not they're not like that kind of book but there there is a lot of opportunity still how long is that opportunity going to last for like when will AI get to the point where it could surpass 999 out of a thousand writers, it's probably not going to be too far in the distance. So I would say write your books while you can <laughs> get it out there. There's, there's well, still okay. opportunity. Yeah. You know, yeah. One other thing that I wanted to mention about, about AI is sort of the, like it gives people the opportunity to give like regular self-published authors, the opportunity to get on kind of level playing ground with the big publishers. And I say this because like, typically it's extremely expensive to write a book, publish a book, get everything out there. But with like modern publishing techniques, modern writing techniques and the editing and uh, translation through artificial intelligence, all of that, finally you could have authors get their ideas out there with the assistance of AI at like a very, very reasonable cost so that they don't need to have like a huge profit on the book back. They just have to have like a decent profit to justify the cost of the book, which are a lot less now. So what we're seeing is we're, what we, we are seeing now and we'll see more in the future is more of like a democracy in a way where you don't just have the, the, the elites like the Stephen Kings that, are, that could publish anything that they want out there dominating the market. I mean, of course, they'll still dominate but you're going to have so many regular folks and have the ability for them to get their ideas out there affordably as well, that uh, the market is going to be filled with like the, this variety of, of different types of authors. And I think that is a very good thing. That's something that AI is bringing to the industry, which is, which is a net positive. Have you, have you had any, are there any books that you've published that are standouts for you? And are, have there been any challenges with that in terms of it's been published through you and then one of the big boys has swooped in and taken an, an author that you have uh, discovered and, and published and done the, the groundwork for? Yes, it happens all the time, which is, which is okay because I, I want, I'm looking out for the interests of the, the author. Of course, we lose money because we're, we make a lot of money when books take off and, and do extremely well. Uh, but when that happens, sometimes big publishers recognize those books. That's what they look for. They contact the author. They make them a deal. They say, hey, we're going to give you 100 grand for your book or 50 grand. And then you get 1% instead of 50% or whatever you're making before. And they're like, yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, I need the cash up front. So unfortunately, we, we lose the revenue from that book. But I, I, I see us as sort of like an incubator in that way. I mean, that's kind of what our job is. Let's get it out there affordably. We'll make a lot of money from these books still, and I'm good with that. But somebody may may buy them out, and we all win in the long run. I'm okay with that. Cool. What's next on the cards for Bo? Because you've obviously done quite a lot. A lot. I don't know how many more books you've got in me. Uh, I don't know how many more books you've got in you. But what is next for Bo? We've mentioned obviously your entrepreneurship side and you've had some quite successful businesses the screenwriting the acting more acting for you or what's next well let, let me just qualify that acting part the the acting is i played i played i i voiced several of the characters in my sitcom and i had a blast doing that i'm not sure how good i am <laughs> so so i just want to qualify that with you you're not going to see me in any hollywood flicks you, you didn't have to too. say that we could have you know <laughs> yeah we, we could have i got it it's just to get out there so what what's next for me I'm fascinated with 
artificial intelligence ability to help people learn new languages. I think that there is still like a huge untapped potential there to, to, to work some kind of learning methodology using artificial intelligence to, to help people learn languages in, in cooperation with some of the more old school technologies like ebooks, audiobooks, videos, and so forth. So I'm working on that. I've, I've got a company called sciencebasedlearning.com. It's a website where I've, I've got the foundation for that going and I'm still working on it on a regular basis. And I'm excited about it because I'm learning a new language. And after I learn my first, I'm going to go on to the second. And I think like now more than ever, this is easier than, than ever before. I think one of the, one of the best ways to learn a new language that has been known for a long time is to immerse yourself in like the culture or like, or, you know, if you want to learn Spanish, Mexican Spanish, Mexico, you go to Mexico and you, you, you pick it up there. Or if you can't do that, obviously it's not for people to just to jump and move in different places of the world. You, you interact with a native speaker, but that's, there's like free stuff for that, but it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. And especially for people who are more on the uh, reserved end and don't like talking to people. But with AI, you can actually do that. And if anybody has seen like the new videos when OpenAI released like their newest model, voice model, which didn't even drop. I mean, I, I, some people get it as of now, but it's not even official until like the fall or something. It's just mind blowing. And to use that and incorporate it some way to help people learn languages, I think that is, that's a huge opportunity. So something that I'm, that I'm excited to be working on. That's awesome. I can imagine people walking around with your product so with the, the, the goggles on and when they pick up an apple, it's got apple in three languages on it. Yeah. So to be much more interactive, these, these things are all going to happen. So that's super exciting. Bo, where can I send folks to learn a little bit more about you and the variety of businesses you have? Well, I have two primary websites. The first one is archieboy.com, and that's where you could go to see all my businesses that we've been talking about, all the different websites. The second one is bobennett.com, and that is where you could find all my books that I've personally written, the old-fashioned way, old school. <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. Take care.